Welcome to the 14th episode of Coexisting with COVID-19. I'm your host, Hanson Hossein, co-founder of the University of Washington's Communication Leadership Graduate Program. This is the university's Office of Public Lecture special series that brings you credible expertise in this time of crisis. Special thanks to these entities for their support. This evening's episode, no, really, are we there yet? Spoilers, no, not yet, but there's some light on the horizon. One year ago this week, the Centers for Disease Control confirmed the first case of COVID-19 in the US right here in Washington state. Health officials declared, we believe the risk to the public is low. This week, one year later, we surpassed 400,000 deaths. As someone pointed out on Twitter, if we spared one second of silence for each COVID death in the US, we'd be standing still for more than four and a half days. It's a dark statistic, and here's a brighter one. As of last month, 54 different vaccines were being tested. It was UW Medicine's Dr. Helen Chu and her team at the Seattle Flu Study that identified that first US COVID case a year ago. This week, she was recognized as Washingtonian of the Year for her essential work in tracking the pandemic. I'm happy to welcome Helen back to Coexisting with COVID-19 after she first updated us on the state of the virus last fall. She's joined by Dr. Vin Gupta, who has become a national public health messenger on the pandemic, getting vaccinated live on NBC's Today Show, even as he advocates assiduously on Twitter for personal preventative measures. Vin also has a role at the UW's Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation and has helped direct Amazon's global COVID-19 response. I have many questions for our two experts. How did we get vaccines so soon? What's going on with those nets? What changes can we expect with the new Biden administration? And will this ever, ever be over? But I'm sure you have even more pressing questions for two of the busiest, most important health leaders on the front lines of this pandemic. They've been there with patients since the earliest days of the outbreak. Email anytime during the episode to mayiask at uw.edu. Helen, welcome back. And Vin, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Helen, we'll start with you as you were there from the beginning with the Seattle flu study. Uh, 400,000 deaths. Why did it have to get so bad in the United States? Um, I think there are a lot of reasons why it got so bad and so quickly. Um, the first is that we had no national coordinated plan for testing for containment of the cases. And so the number of cases rapidly exploded over those first several weeks. And then once we had more testing on board and were able to buy the cases, we didn't really have a good plan for management of all the cases in the community. So masks and other personal protective equipment and all of the resources that we needed in the hospitals to be able to, to take care of the, the numbers of patients that came in in these, in these waves, the first one, then the second one, and now as we enter into the third one. So here we are. Yeah. And here we are. And given what your experience was early on to now, how have things changed for you as a medical professional in dealing with the pandemic? Well, I mean, there's much more PPE, so that's that's good. Um, there's much more access to testing. Um, well, the hospitals here in Washington State have actually done a really good job of um, maintaining uh, capacity to handle the patients. And a lot of things have been put in place that we now use for standardized treatment of these patients. A lot of these trials that we did early on, the trials of remdesivir and the trials of the monoclonal antibodies, and all of those things have now given us the, the capability to be able to manage the patients that come in and they're living longer than, than they were at the beginning of the pandemic. Then you've heard Helen describe this trajectory and some of the shortfalls that we've had. In your experience, how avoidable was this? Well, I, I of course agree with everything that uh, Dr. Chu just mentioned. Uh, I, I think if, if we're looking back on the last year, it's it's clear that if we had the personnel in place, if we had a focus on preparedness for pandemics, if that was a focus uh, of our government uh, for, for the years preceding this pandemic, that uh, we would have averted the worst of it. I, I'm convinced of that uh, because it, it was clear early on that this might have been an airborne respiratory pathogen. 
uh, that was different from uh, other airborne respiratory pathogens, different from other coronaviruses. And, um, and if we had uh, the ability to have a national strategy, if we had consistent messaging, uh, you know, this is not my opinion. This is, these are models both IHME and other institutions have put out, suggesting that of, say, the 80,000 individuals that died by May 1st, maybe we could have saved 30 to 40,000 of those if we locked down earlier, if we had a strategic national stockpile that was uh, appropriately equipped with both N95 masks and ventilators. So we weren't having these conversations in real time and trying to react and sort of instead of uh, uh, focusing on prevention. So assuredly a forward focused um, or, or forward thinking approach to pandemic preparedness and, and uh, appropriate leadership uh, would, have, uh, would have allowed us to follow a trajectory that was more akin to what our, many of our allies have experienced, which is certainly um, very uh, difficulties at certain points, but nothing unlike what we've experienced, which is of course the worst outbreak uh, worldwide. I mean, that is that was entirely avoidable, uh, and and that's been a failure of leadership. And speaking of messaging, which you just mentioned, you've you obviously t believe that you you must commit. You've taken a commitment being a public messenger around this, doing some very public things on Twitter and on television. Why has it been so important for you to play that role as a medical professional? Well, I, I guess first I would say I, I didn't ask for the role, um, and I had done occasionally on IHME's requests uh, when vaping or gun violence was uh, uh, dominating headlines. I'd gotten asked to speak to media on on, uh, on some of these issues, leveraging some of the work that we're doing on the global burden of disease to provide context, uh, or to speak as a long doc on some of these issues of public health importance. And so this, this sort of happened by circumstance. And I rapidly realized as, and I'm not the only one messaging on this, I have there's certainly colleagues across the country trying to do something similar, but in whatever small platform I do have, I've tried to just use it responsibly. And clearly, uh, if you, if from the very early days of this pandemic, there has been a need uh, from the uh, on the part of the public to understand what's true and what's not true. And people are scared, people are anxious. Right now, people are scared and they're anxious in the worst of the pandemic. And uh, so if I've been able to provide some measure of trust and comfort, um, I've, been, I've taken that role really seriously and uh, try to be as responsible with the platform as possible. Thanks for that, Vin. So Helen, you know, we've heard even today from, from Washington, D.C. that things are get a lot worse before they get better. And the premise to this particular episode is, are we there yet? So how, do you, how, optimist, how optimistic do you feel in terms of we're hearing that numbers are plateauing, plus vaccines are getting out. You know, how much are we headed in the right direction right now? I think a lot of things changed yesterday. Um, so I think that a lot of things got put in place or will be getting put in place over the course of the next several days to weeks to head us in the right direction. So I am optimistic. I'm generally an optimist. Um, I, I think that, that we can fix things. But if you look at where we've what we've already accomplished in terms of the treatments that we've um, we've discovered and the vaccines, and we, it's really been amazing what's happened in vaccines, and the fact that we now are heading towards a national coordinated strategy with testing, with um, with vaccine rollout, with a plan for school and workplace reopening. All of these are starting to come together with the resources behind it to actually make it happen. The thing that I would worry about, oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, just for the purposes of, of our audience, I mean, uh, for people who watch this later, we are one day after the inauguration of uh, President Joe Biden. And so there's been a sea change in terms of direction, which is what Helen was talking about. So go ahead, Helen, please continue mm -hmm. your thought. Well, I was just going to say that the one of the things that may derail this is the emergence of the new variants. Um, and so the question about the role of vaccines in preventing um, disease from the new variants, whether or not these potential variants can escape the vaccines that we are already administering. I think those are open questions right now that will be answered probably in the next several days to weeks, given the pace of science. Um, but it is something that, that we worry about. Coronavirus, like all other RNA viruses, mutates pretty quickly. Um, and so we are always going to be playing catch up. Um, and so there's a lot of work done being done nationally now in terms of preparing for 
what may happen, anticipating the fact that some of these new variants may become the dominant strains or variants that are circulating in the United States, and then doing the, the work now to prepare for um, changing the strains that will be in the vaccine to accommodate for, for what may come. Yeah, uh, then uh, just thinking about the vaccines and those variants that Helen was talking about, you know, in all the conversations we've had on this show over the last year, the talk was about vaccines coming out maybe later in 2021. The fact that we got here this quickly and you've already been vaccinated uh, and now we have this variants. What's your feeling about this present situation in terms of it seems like we came up with a solution much faster than ever expected, but we're still in this incredible mire. Uh, and we're in a really dangerous situation, uh, Hanson. Uh, yesterday, a big day for the country in terms of a transition of power. Uh, one thing that didn't get talked about a lot was that 4,400 people died, uh, or, or nearly 4,400 people died, over 200,000 cases. It's just where we become numb to this reality uh, that we've been trying to trend out and forecast here at IHME, but uh, you know, 20,000 deaths week over week for several weeks, doubling uh, it's an effective doubling of uh, the, the second leading cause of death in the United States, which is generally ischemic heart disease, heart disease just more broadly. I mean, these are astonishing numbers. And uh, I, I think it's it's easy to be just to, to be rooted and to accept that this is our current reality um, and hoping that vaccines will um, guide us out of it. They will. Um, and to every, everything Helen just mentioned, you know, hopefully we can get vaccines up and running in, in people's arms quickly because the longer it takes, the longer uh, we're allowing coronavirus to mutate and to, to potentially give rise to an escape variant that might not be a, but that might uh, prove, uh, or, or in which vaccines or natural infection might prove ineffective in terms of combating. So we need to do this quickly. What I will say also, and just leveraging the good work of my colleagues at IHME, it's really critical to remember that nearly 600,000 individuals we forecast will probably die by May 1st. And we're noticing as well that even a quick vaccination ramp up, if we if we meet President Biden's goal of 100 million doses in 100 days, that's really only going to avert 40,000 deaths by May 1st. Uh, uh, and we're still going to ex be experiencing the worst of this pandemic up until then. So vaccination is our way out, but it's not our way out of our current predicament where many people are dying every single day. So we really need to still focus on uh, on the things we've been preaching on since March or February, March of 2020, um, and really focusing on also diminishing case transmission, and, and, and which begs the question, should we be opening up schools, for example, with this new strain, with, with all this concern with an out of control pandemic? I mean, these are the questions that I get asked, and they're difficult questions. What do you say when you're asked that question about opening schools? Because schools are beginning to think about opening, especially in this region. Well, and my opinion is I don't think it makes a ton of sense. Uh, four weeks ago, I was on board with opening schools. I think we had reasonable data that was re uh, replicated across several studies suggesting that children don't transmit the, the virus as, as, as readily as adults. That seems to be the case with this new B117 variant out of the UK, but it looks like this is more transmissible across all age groups. So you're still gonna see more cases amongst kids and you're gonna certainly see more cases amongst adults. Adults, And so it's, and in the UK, they actually noticed more cases because schools were actually the only, one of the only places in society that were actually open. That's where they were detecting some of these increased case rates. And so they shut down schools. I'm hearing from teachers unions and teachers across the country that they wanna get vaccinated before they were to go back to in-person instruction. And I have to say, it just, it, it, it's consistent. Why, why in gather in a congregate setting with an uncertain situation, um, if you can avoid it, even though we all recognize virtual instruction is, is, is not ideal, uh, but why do it with such a dangerous situation? So my, my, my vote would be, let's vaccinate people before we put them into an in-person environment and in, 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 in a con in a congregant environment, let's vaccinate and protect them so we can mitigate the loss of life. Yeah, and th that response, Vin, is actually a direct answer to one of the questions we just received from the audience in terms of risk for to going back to school and whether kids should be vaccinated before doing so. And obviously your answer is we shouldn't be going back to school and yes, they should be vaccinated beforehand. So thanks for, for answering so directly on that. Um, 
uh, Helen, you've been involved with, you've been working with the NIH and National Institutes of Health on this, on, on the thoughts around the vaccine. Um, one question we did get from the audience is with the new administration, what do you anticipate the vaccine rollout to look like? I don't know if you've had any unique perspectives into that as you've had conversations with your colleagues across the country around vaccine distribution. Yeah, I mean, right now, the a lot of the issues around vaccines are um, supply chain issues um, and then logistics of getting them to where they need to be. Um, in terms of the ramp of whether or not that's going to increase over the next couple of weeks with the Biden administration, I'm confident that everything will go faster. But I think the first step right now is to just take stock of the situation and figure out what's actually the problem and where the where where the um, the, the issues are that need to be fixed to be able to get those vaccine doses out. I would also like to just comment on the fact that um, the idea of waiting until children are vaccinated before reopening schools, which I, I actually don't agree with. Um, uh, the, the pediatric studies are just starting now. Um, we are running them. Many people um, who are part of the um, vaccine trials units are doing these studies, and those won't be completed um, conservatively for months, months, and potentially we won't have data for six months to a year. So I think that if we were to actually wait until we have data about safety in children and then roll out of vaccines in children to be able to reopen schools, that won't happen for another year. And I don't think personally that the, the, um, the, risk of, the risk of missing school for two years is worth the wait. Um, mm -hmm. I, I would say that get the teachers vaccinated that's clearly important and can be done right now. And at that point, um, that's when we reopen. But I would not wait another year for pediatric vaccines. Uh, Vin, and, I, and have... I just wanted to go ahead. Yeah, no, I just wanted to clarify. I, I, I think I, I'm completely aligned with what Helen just mentioned. Um, I think we need to, and uh, you know, publicly stating this as well, that uh, my, my comments were directed on teachers and adult staff, not not children, for the reasons that. Helen mentioned, I think it's vital that, that teachers and adult staff are vaccinated because we have the vaccine, they're in tier 1B, and it's going to take a couple months. So in, in my view, for the reasons Helen uh, just articulated, children, uh, uh, we, we can't be waiting for children to get vaccinated for a variety of reasons, one of which is um, they don't tend to end up in, um, with severe cases nearly with the frequency as adults do, severe COVID pneumonia, for example. But I think it's absolutely vital that that teachers and adults have get vaccinated before in-person instruction. Frankly, that's just not happening across the country. No, I completely agree. Well, thanks. Thanks for both of you for clarifying that and for reaching consensus on what is a really <laughs> crucial question right now. Uh, I, another specific question for, for you, Vin, and the, I was just reflecting back upon President Biden saying even today that more people have died from COVID-19 in the United States than died in World War II. And that because vaccines still aren't assured that there are some very simple preventative measures that everyone should be taking. And you have said the same thing on your social channels. And so the question is, can you give your best recommendation around masks? I don't know if this person is looking for specifics around the mask itself or just mask usage, but I'm sure you've got some very specific ideas about how masks should be deployed by people. Sure. I, you know, I've, whenever I've had a platform, I try to, um, I use a props and I have them right next to my desk. So I, I think any sort of three ply medical type mask is the way to go. And so it's really hard. And we, what we do know is that three ply is helpful, um, based on studies done by people vastly smarter than me on air, in airborne science. Um, and we also know that ear loops are not ideal, so that if you can actually get a nice tight snug fit around the ear, either by sort of doing your own modified tie, so you have a nice fit of this three-ply mask on your cheeks, that's nice. Um, if you have the head tie with one of these three-ply masks, even better, so you can really get that snug fit. But we, we there is reasonable data from airborne scientists or aerosol scientists out in Virginia Tech. Duke's done a few of these studies, I'm sure Helen and references just as well as I can, if not better, that uh, there is a gradient of efficacy when it comes to masks and protection from uh, and exposure to COVID-19 in public places. But some sort of three-ply medical blue mask, I'm trying to make this as sort of accessible as possible to folks, better than we think a thin one-ply cloth mask, for example, or certainly better than a neck gaiter where you just sort of, I mean, I've seen tons of college-age students, not to call out 
our young my uh, our younger millennial friends, but um, just pulling something up and that we know that doesn't work. And so th there is a gradient here, but uh, you can't go wrong with a three ply medical type mask um, or something multi layer cloth mask where you have um, uh, ideally two layers of thick um, uh, uh, thick cloth material with say a filter sandwich in between. We also think that's good. Of course, KN95s are I think non inferior. Some studies suggest that are as they're better than these these uh, three ply masks. So that would be that could be an option. Um, and, and then I won't delve into the whole N95 debate, but um, you know there's a lot of people who have strong feelings about whether N95 masks should be made more available. All I'll say is that we need to move into the government both now and then for the future um, needs to think about how can we provide people with the best quality masks that are well fitting to them to protect from the next respiratory pandemic if it's an aerosol transmitted pandemic and or for example, wildfires um, and wildfire smoke. I can say in my role at Amazon, protecting our essential frontline staff or couriers when we had wildfire season was complicated uh, because you have to not only think about access to N95s, but how do you fit people appropriately to these types of masks? So we need it. We need help here. We need an infrastructure. We need a supply chain. That was very helpful and specific. And also, you're right about that. In fact, even today, with the report, the strategy report coming out of the White House, referenced that we have to finally address the supply issue around these particular um, implements that we all need to have. So you're, you're absolutely right about that, Helen. Another another question from our audience in terms of vaccination: What are your thoughts of returning to work after I've been fully vaccinated? Now that we're beginning to get access to this. Yeah, so this leads into the question of once you are vaccinated, are you protected from asymptomatic infection or having an infection where you don't have symptoms and, and therefore potentially um, leading to transmission to other people? So that question is yet to be answered. Um, there is every reason to, to think that getting a vaccine protects you from carrying the virus, um, that there are some early data from the phase one, phase two, so those, those very, very early trials where they looked at this specifically in small numbers of people. And they found that they were less likely to carry the virus asymptomatically if they had been vaccinated. And if you're less likely to carry, you're not going to pass it to others. That doesn't mean you should not wear a mask. You should still continue to take the same measures that you were taking before you received your vaccine. But there is some reassuring data from those early studies and other studies are about to start. Um, in, in the United States, um, I can tell you, um, that will directly answer this question. Okay, great. Well, thank you for that. I, you know, I'm trying my best to keep this as uh, timeless an episode as possible, but we are right now in the middle of so much breaking news around this pandemic with all the things that are coming out of Washington, D.C. and Olympia. So, Vin, there's a question about immunization schedule coming out for the governor. Um, and I think the same thing applies to the president of the United States. He, he has a very ambitious plan to see 100 million people immunized in the next 100 days. And then and Governor Inslee put out uh, some, some targets in terms of vaccinations in Washington state. How realistic do you think this is or what changes need to happen uh, given what we think the situation is right now? Well, you know, I know a lot was made of the initial hiccups and I, I think hiccups are to be expected. Uh, you know and just coming from prior military and now as a reservist, um, recognizing that we had military leaders helping with the supply chain. I mean, these things are complicated. And so I wasn't surprised that we had some some upfront hiccups that um, are still being ironed out when it comes to, you know, states not getting the supplies that they were expecting. I do think General Perna and the leaders at ODWS are, are one, capable and two, highly talented. And I'm hoping that uh, there's some continuity in terms of leadership so we don't have complete disruption here. Um, I, do, I also think that um, mon the money that's being requested from Congress, you know, 160 billion for state and local governments to train uh, uh, immunizers and supervisors who can actually conduct some of these um, uh, uh, or help uh, with these pop-up clinics across the country, I mean, that's going to take time for that to actually come into uh, state and local departments of health and then be be spent uh, to, to help with training. And and so there's going to be a lag period here. But do I think with rationing of supply ending, hopefully pretty soon, where we're going to have no issues with supply, do I hope that everything sort of comes together? I'm optimistic, as, as Helen mentioned, she is as well. Uh, 
and, and hopefully a, a hundred million doses is an underestimate. Um, and I'm hoping that we can really um, meet demand more quickly. I will say that I, you know, I'm Virginia Mason and Amazon have partnered on Sunday to, to actually do a pop-up clinic, a proof of concept, if you will, in, at, at Amazon in downtown Seattle, where uh, individuals can sign up. I don't know the exact details for how you actually sign up for, for that specific clinic, but something like that I know is going to be happening at T the T-Mobile Park where the Mariners play. You're going to see, I mean, these are going to be proof of concepts that then need to be replicated across the country. Uh, but once there's that that playbook, it's going to be hopefully easier to replicate, especially with more supply. Yeah. Well, uh, Helen, more breaking news. <laughs> uh, you know, the, today the United States announced it was re-entering the World Health Organization after leaving it uh, under the Trump administration. What does the, and this is a question from the audience, what does uh, America's re-entry into the WHO change in terms of our nation's positions globally with regards to COVID-19 efforts? You've been involved so much in our national efforts. How much is this, by reconnecting to the rest of the world and their efforts, how much does that change things for us and for the world? I think it just harmonizes the message more than anything else. It, it demonstrates that we are part of um, a global solution. I think it also sort of um, increases our buy-in to making sure that vaccines get to countries where there currently is no vaccine and, and is anticipated to not have vaccine for the next several weeks to months, like many parts of Sub-Saharan Africa and South America. So I think that, that having the U.S. be part of that coordinated global response, that recognizing that this pandemic is not a U.S. issue where we just vaccinate our own citizens and really is, is something that we need to solve globally. And that will be really, really important. I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, it feels like we're reconnecting with the rest of the world. Vin, did you have anything to add to that or uh, in terms of our relationship with these organizations? Well, I wanted to ask you specifically then, Vin, um, this, 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 I think your role, not only as a medical practitioner, but also as a trusted communicator is really interesting, especially when you look at the national strategy coming out of Washington to say today, where the first point of their seven goals is to restore trust with the American people. A lot of people have said that we're dealing with a double or a triple pandemic. It's the virus, it's disinformation, and it's racism. Uh, how important has this element of trust been in your effectively doing your work? I think, you know, I, I will say this. I, I, I do think that um, in, in taking sort of a, a, perhaps an unconventional path in my career, where whether it's military or more policy focused roles, uh, you, you get exposed to, um, it, you know, I've been exposed to kind of the way that things work in academia and how, uh, how things work outside of academia when it comes to medicine and public health. And uh, to me, the common denominator here is if you do not have, if you cannot speak to people in playing language and meet them where they are, uh, then you're not gonna be able to get their trust. And often uh, I, I think you get taught in medical school and perhaps in, in clinical training to sound really smart and, and, and you're graded on that. And that's how your colleagues view you. Well, are they, how many acronyms can they wheel off from how many studies uh, relevant to whatever problem we're dealing with in the ICU, for example? You get taught to, talk, to, to speak like that. And so it's, I've had to untrain myself to, to, to hopefully be a little bit more accessible to folks. Um, it's, I'm still a work in progress, as I know I speak to my colleagues who do similar roles. It's hard and uh, you don't please everybody. And you have to accept that. But uh, it, without trust and without reaching people where they are, really none of, we, we could have the best science in the world that won't matter. We had great science on masks, it didn't matter for a long period of time because we had terrible communication and a lot of contradictory statements. So um, I think the same thing is gonna apply with vaccines. Well, uh, Helen, I asked Vin about trust, so a big picture question. I'm gonna ask you a big picture question about leadership. You know, being uh, recognized as Washingtonian of the year for the work you've done with the Seattle flu study, especially in those early days in identifying that first case in, in the United States, you had to take some pretty big risks yourself in terms of leading on identifying and making people aware of what was really going on. Um, how unorthodox is that in terms of the role that you did take on to really bring this to our attention and bring this to officials' attention? Yes, I know. I think it's the same thing. Whereas as a physician, and to become a physician, you are really, really good at uh, at, at following the rules. <laughs> and I think that's that's one thing that, that we become great at. Um, so 
I think about that a lot because I am a rule follower. Um, I am the person who does not park in the 30 minute spots. And I, I just, I, I, you know, I don't ever cut in line. So things like that. So I, I wonder what happened a lot uh, that, that ended up in the situation that we were in. And I think it was just, you know, at that moment in time when we had to make a decision about what to do that night, um, we just thought, you know, there are these rules and they are made for times of um, ordinary times, but they're not made for extraordinary times. And so at that moment, we felt like we had to, we just had to, to color outside the lines and make some decisions. Um, and ultimately, I think it was okay. You know, but, but I think we went into it, all of us, the entire group of us, it was not a solo decision with the understanding that there were going to be consequences to, to making that decision, that it was, um, it was very clear that that was not permitted to to go ahead and, and tell the, the the kid and his parents that that they had coronavirus. So so that was that was tough. Um, I, I mean I, I think that working with with having strong relationships with local public health at the outset with local public health and with state public health and their supportiveness of, of what we were doing was really really important and um, and just being in academics. You know the ability to be able to work with all of these local and state partners um, and to be able to be part of this sort of coordinate at the beginning that was really really um, i think pivotal to, to what we were able to do so vin helen just said these are extraordinary times and they are and all of us really want to go back to less extraordinary times sooner than later um i saw you on twitter recently taking alaska airlines to task for selling middle seats uh, because we're not quite, you don't believe we're quite ready to do that yet. So the question for you is like, what's it going to be, what's it going to take? Or what is our best way, our safest way to trans transition back to some semblance of normalcy so that we can do things and connect to people face to face and sit in middle seats again on airplanes? Yeah. Um, I, oh, I, I'll just, a quick follow up on what Helen said. I, I, you know, you don't typically have uh, junior faculty like myself in my role at IHME um take on these roles but i will say i to me uh has been so incredibly supportive in a ways that i could never have imagined and has bolstered me in what has been um a, a unique space that uh you know i didn't expect and so i think you need institutional support you need the right mentors um it, it, to if you're going to be out there if you're going to try to lead in whatever fashion you need people to support you. And uh, the University of Washington and UW Medicine, I to me in particular, has been incredible um, as, as sort of my base of support uh, uh, to encourage me to keep going on, again, whatever platform I have. I will say um, to your question, I think the solution is in right in front of us, luckily, uh, that we don't have to wait years for a vaccine, that it's right here. And we just have to figure out how to distribute and do mass vaccination campaigns. There's been, st uh, you know, I, I'm, I won't claim these as my own ideas, but lots of smart uh, uh, commentary on this um, in recent days about how we need to think about a distribution plan that's less about like that looks less like seasonal flu and more like um, uh, other efforts like smallpox, other um, uh, like the contingency contingencies we had in place after 9/11 for vaccinating. If, if, for example, there was a bioterrorism event for pathogens that we were feared might get released, then there are strategies in place. Um, that uh, we have yet to take advantage of, um, that I'm hoping with President-elect Biden we will, but it's gonna really uh, require us reaching herd immunity to Helen's earlier point. Hopefully um, we can do that quickly so that we don't have an escape strain that poses problems. So I think the combination of herd immunity quickly and no strains causing us problems in terms of increased hospitalizations and deaths is gonna be the one-two punch. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to put this concluding question to both of you just to, to, to think about an end to this pandemic one day, hopefully sooner than later. And there's obviously so many lessons to be learned from everything that we've gone through and everything we're going to continue to go through. Thinking big picture, I'll start with you, Helen. What's the one change you would like to see once we've emerged from this, whether it's a public policy change, a health policy change, or something very specific that we must not ignore after everything we've gone through? Well, I would like universal health care. I mean, I think if I had to pick one thing, I feel like a lot of the, the what we found was co with COVID is, is that people who um, 
who are marginalized were the ones who are dying. And a lot of that marginalization is a result of our disparate healthcare system where people who have insurance do well and people who don't have insurance don't do well. And it's just, I feel like there's some major national changes that need to happen to make sure that something like this doesn't have such a disproportionate effect on certain populations. Given the incredible, I got to follow up on this, given the incredible politicization we've seen even in just addressing this, this once in a lifetime crisis, how confident are you that we might actually reach some kind of consensus on something like universal health care, where so many other nations that we do business with have? I, I grew up in Canada. I was born in England. They all have universal health care. How certain could we be able to do this here? We have a fight in an office now. I, I think I, I'm optimistic. I feel like if this is the time, this, th this could be the moment. Um, we are coming out of a pandemic. We see what happens when you have a broken health care system. This is really the time for it to happen, at least I hope. Vin, thank you for that. Uh, Vin, final word to you on what one big change should we take away from this crisis that will serve us better in the future? I, I, for, I, uh, uh, Helen, uh, uh, that was uh, the answer that I was going to provide. So I was going to say uh, maybe, this, no, 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 that was that's great, fantastic. Um, I mean, top of mind I, and spot on. Uh, I, I would say, so we don't keep debating this every four years, if there's a transition in uh, a power across political parties, we should fundamentally push and hopefully as a global community of nations, push for the WHO to actually have an effector mechanism to, influ to, to really um, uh, influence policy in, in a real way. And, to, and I, right now they are weakened because they can only issue recommendations in many cases, mm -hmm. and they're reliant on uh, on the political agendas of a few countries that um, obviously can warp their priorities and 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 weaken their influence. And so we need a strong WHO that has an effector mechanism um, to hold countries accountable that are not, for example, adhering to the international health regulations. I mean, how many countries did not uh, adhere to the international health regulations in just this pandemic? whether it was banning travel, and, and I know we've uh, changed our approach to banning travel, but the IH, I mean, these guidelines that were established right after the SARS epidemic, SARS-1 in the mid 2000s were, were put out there for a reason so that we could actually respond effectively as a global community of nations on data sharing, on how do we actually approach things? How do we get key resources uh, to, to countries that need them quickly? Uh, and, and we're going to face another pandemic soon enough, and we need global coordination. And so we need a WHO that's positioned and empowered to do so. So I hope that's the big change. That's great. So more muscular enforcement and more health care. Um, those are two great ways to conclude our conversation. Thank you very much, Dr. Helen Chu and Dr. Vingutta for your life-saving insights and for your crucial leadership during this crisis. And thank you for joining us for this final episode of Coexisting with COVID-19 for this season. From the onset of the pandemic, I've engaged with some of the university's leading experts, such as Vin and Helen, on how to manage this crisis. And we've also answered your questions of what it practically takes to coexist with this virus at home, at work, at school, and in our communities. It's well worth your time to catch up on all those useful insights through our past episodes at bit.ly slash coexist archive. A year into the pandemic, there's some hope ahead, as you heard from Vin and Helen, and there's still much peril. So we'll be back this spring to update where we stand as we strive to return to our lives and to our loved ones. As always, registration is free. Sign up for that next episode at uw.edu slash lectures. Until then, I'm Hanson Hossein. Be well and be safe.